You're watching a Channel 98 NBISD TV production. Hey, welcome to another edition of That Geometry Show. As always, I'm your groovy Funkadelic host, Kevin Corby. Now, if you tuned in last week and you really enjoyed last week's show, then you've tuned into the right show again because we're talking about pretty much the exact same shapes. That's prisms, cylinders, pyramids, and cones. Except today, to make it different from last week's show, we're going to be looking at the volume instead of the surface area. It's a three-dimensional quantity. So download those worksheets from the district website www.newbrunfels.txed.net and turn up your televisions because today's show is about volume. Today is lesson 25 and if you're following along in your textbook it's uh, chapter 11.5 and 11.6 talking about volume today of prisms, cylinders, pyramids, and cones and again it's the same thing we looked at last week except this week we're looking at volume, a three-dimensional quantity as opposed to last week we talked about two dimensions uh, with surface area. And just like last week, understanding today's lesson is going to come down to two important uh, aspects. Using the correct formula, whether it's from your head or from the formula chart, and finding the correct values to plug into that formula. Now, depending on your teacher, you may have to memorize some of these. I know I try to make my students memorize as much as possible because you never know when you're going to be on a deserted island you don't have that formula chart with you. Okay? So make sure you know which ones you have to memorize and which ones you don't have to memorize. You should know how to use all of them. All right, so we'll start off by looking at a right prism. And we're going to look at the volume of a right prism, of course. So let's go ahead and define what the formula is. The volume V of a right prism with a base area of capital B. Okay, so you'll see a capital letter to denote an area of the base. Uh, and a height of H units is given by the volume is the area of the base B times the height. Well, let's review what a prism is again. A prism is basically a polygon uh, as a base, and it's a congruent polygon on the other side, and they're connected by these lateral sides. So H is going to be the length of a side that connects one of the two faces. If you imagine standing this pentagonal prism up on its side, now the H really looks more like a height. But it doesn't have to be oriented vertically to call it H. Okay, we have a triangular prism. The base is a triangle. The height is the side that connects the two bases. And here we have a hexagonal prism. And H, again, is one of the lengths that connects the two uh, bases. So each of these is a different base. So they're going to have a different formula to calculate the area of the base. But in any of the three cases, if I can find the area of the base, I just multiply it by H to get the volume. So in this case, since it's a pe pen pentagon for the base, the formula for the area of a pentagon is 1 half P perimeter times A, the apothem. So we have to be given enough information to find that. This one's a triangle, so the, the formula for the area of a triangle is 1 half B, the base, that's little b, that's one of the side lengths, in, case this, in this case it's the bottom one here, and times H. Now, you have to uh, distinguish between the context of one formula to the next. This H right here is going to end up being the height or the altitude of the triangle. It's listed as H on the formula chart. But the H in this diagram is the length or the height of the prism that connects the two bases. So we have to understand that one letter in one formula might refer to a different quantity in the same diagram. We have to be aware of the context. Again, this one here is a hexagon, which is a polygon, so the area of the base is one half the perimeter times the apothem. Okay? So it comes down to finding the area of the base, multiplying it by the height, and we have the volume, three dimensions. Let's look at an example. This is one of the same diagrams from last time, but we're going to find a different quantity. We want to find the volume of this right triangular prism. Well, we know the volume of a prism is the area of the base, B, times the height. Notice the quantities that I'm given. It looks like this is an equal lateral triangle for the base, and it shows that the side connecting the two bases is 6, so I know that's my H. So I need to find what the base or the height of this uh, triangle is so I can use the formula for the area of a triangle, which I'll write off to the side here. The area of a triangle is 1 half the base times the height. 
Well, the base is going to be this right here. It's just going to be one of the side lengths, which is 4. This right here is the height of the triangle that I'm looking for, not the height of the prism. Well, since this is an equilateral triangle, remember, this altitude is also a perpendicular bisector, so that half the length of the base is one of the lengths in the right triangle. So I do have a right triangle here, and I can set it up. So I have 2 squared plus h squared equals 4 squared. And this is kind of going off to the side and finding the quantities that I need. If I solve, I get h squared equals 16 minus 4. So h is the square root of 12, which is 2 square root of 3 inches. That's the height, not of my prism, but of my triangle. So that's really all I need to calculate the area of the base. So I can go ahead and now plug that into the formula for the volume of this prism. The area of the base is 1 half the base of the triangle, which I just found to be uh, over here to be 2, times the height of the triangle, which is 2 square root of 3. So this is essentially our B. We multiply that now times the third dimension in our prism, which is 6. And all we have to do now is put these numbers together and calculate it, and it looks like we get, uh, with the square root of 3 showing, 24 square root of 3 that's going to be cubic inches, or inches cubed. And if you have a calculator, you can punch it in, and it comes out to about 41.569 cubic inches. So the units for volume are going to be cubic inches, because we have three dimensions. We have length, width, and depth, and that's three of them. Okay. Now we also looked at nets last time, and nets were especially useful to helping us find the surface area, because we're just looking at a flat representation, so we're seeing all the sides. Well, we can also use a net to help us calculate the volume. We just have to be a little more careful and a little more deliberate in identifying the sides. Let's have a look-see. In this example, we want to find the volume of the right triangular prism that's given by this net. Now, this kind of looks like a, a nice airplane with a big flat nose here. But again, what is a net? It's, a, it's an object that's been cut along the edges and it's laid flat. So a right triangular prism, we know that the volume is the base, the area of the base, times the height. Well, let's think about what the base is going to be. If I imagine folding this up, the bases are going to be the two congruent uh, polygons. And that's going to be these triangles right here. They're actually right triangles. If I folded those up, those would form the two congruent bases. So again, it's a triangle. I can plug it into my formula. The big B is going to be 1 half. This is the area of a triangle again, 1 half times the base. Well, this is isometric dot paper, so I can actually count. The base of one of the triangles is from here. We got 1, 2, 3, 4 units times the height of the triangle is going to be 1, 2 units up. So again, this calculation right here is just area of the base. Now, here's where we have to be really careful. We need to identify the height of this prism. Well, remember from the previous page, the height is nothing more than the length of the side that connects the two bases. And that's important in identifying it from the net. Uh, this is not the height right here. The height connects the two bases. So either one of these we can consider to be the H. They're the same length. Let's count. One unit, two units, three units across. So that would be essentially my height of the prism. Now that I have carefully identified all the quantities, plugged it into my equation, now it's really the easy part. We just have to evaluate it. And if we evaluate this, we get uh, 12. And there's no units given, so I'm just going to put units cubed or cubic units uh, just to show that I'm aware that it is, in fact, the volume. Okay, so prisms, area of the base, that's what big B is, times the height. All right, let's look at the volume of a right cylinder now. The volume of a cylinder with a height of h and a radius of r is given by this formula. Volume v equals pi, which remember is about 3.14, times the radius of the base squared times the height. So here's a diagram basically of a cylinder. It looks like a Coke can or a coffee can. Uh, remember, a cylinder can be thought of as a prism with a circular base. And so a circle has a radius, and the height of the cylinder is going to be h. Now, notice that we can really call this, the volume is still big B times H, where B is the area of the base, because what is our base? It's a circle. 
And the area of a circle has a formula of pi r squared. So it's really the same formula as up here. We just have a built-in uh, formula for the area of the base. Okay? Let's go ahead and take a look at an example that uses this formula. Find the volume of this cylinder. Okay. Notice that we have a circular top, and it's showing us that this length of the segment here, which we can assume is the radius, is 6 inches. So I'm going to go ahead and label that as R. And it gives us a diagonal right here, a diagonal measure in a right circular cylinder. That's 25.5. Well, that's not the height that I need for my formula. Let's go ahead and write the formula out. It's pi r squared h. Well, I have the radius. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and check that off. Check, I got that. Pi is just 3.14, so I know what that is. Uh, I'm trying to find the volume, so it's okay not to know the V. That means I have to find H in order to use this formula. Well, let me go ahead and label what H is on the diagram. And now I can remember that, oh yeah, this is a right circular cylinder, which means if I draw the diameter across the bottom, this creates a right triangle. And one of the sides of the right triangle is, in fact, the diameter. So remember, the diameter is just 2 times the radius. So if the radius is 6, 2 times 6 is 12. And the diagonal now, 25.5, ends up being the hypotenuse in the right triangle. So let me go ahead and find what h is. Uh, I can set up my Pythagorean theorem. So I have h squared plus 12 squared equals 25.5 squared. And if I solve, I get h equals the square root of, doing the math, uh, you get 506.25, which when you evaluate that, gives you about 22 and a half inches. So that's what the H is. That's what I need. Okay, now that I have gathered all my posies here, everything that I need to plug into the equation, let's check off the H. I got it. Now we can plug in. And it's convenient that the value that we're trying to find V is already isolated on the left-hand side. So let's plug in. We have the volume of the cylinder, V equals pi, well that's 3.14. Uh, the radius is still 6, and don't forget to square it, that's pi r squared, that's the area of the base, times the height that we just found up here to be 22.5 inches, and we calculate that, punch the numbers on the calculator, and you get 2544.690, if you round to three decimals, inches cubed. That's going to be a three-dimensional quantity, so it's volume. That means that that can holds that many cubic inches worth of stuff. Okay, whatever stuff you want to put in it. That's the capacity, the volume. All right, now speaking of formulas, which is what this one was up here, sometimes we call formulas literal equations. Literal, the word literal, literally means letters. So an equation that has letters in it and possibly a constant like pi is called a literal equation. Now, just like we were searching for our values up here, we can solve a literal equation or a formula for any one of the unknowns so long as we know all the others. Okay? Here is what I mean. Here's an example, a nice one. Tate is constructing a cylinder that can hold 90.8 cubic centimeters. Tate likes to construct cylinders. What can I say? If the diameter of the cylinder is 3.4, what should the height of Tate's cylinder measure? Well, let's pull out our formula for the volume of a cylinder. Volume is pi r squared h. What do we know in this problem? We actually are given what the volume needs to be. So we know v. Uh, we know pi is pi. We know the diameter is 3.4. So if the diameter is 3.4, the radius is half of that. So the radius is 1.7. So we know the radius. We're trying to find the height. Now notice this equation is not solved for h. You have two options at this point. D determining what your teacher wants is probably the best way to approach this problem. You can either plug in the quantities that you know and solve for H, or you can solve for your unknown quantity immediately and get what's called a working equation, which is what you probably need to do in a science class. So I'm going to go ahead and solve this little equation for H. I'm going to divide both sides by pi r squared. Watch what happens. I get pi r squared times H. And if I divide both sides by pi r squared, pi r squared, pi r squared, they'll divide out here, leaving just h equals the volume divided by pi r squared, the quantity. Okay, so now I've taken that formula, that literal equation, 
and I have isolated the variable that I want to solve for. And I know everything else on the right hand side. So now I can just plug in. The volume is 90.8 centimeters uh, divided by pi uh, times the radius. Remember the radius was half the diameter, so that's going to be 1.7 squared. Now a quick note about putting this into your calculator. You have to hit 90.8 divided by, and you have to put parentheses around your two factors in the denominator, or type in divided by pi divided by 17 squared. If you just type in 90.8 divided by pi times 1.7 squared, it's going to divide by the pi and take that answer and multiply it, which is not dividing, by 1.7 squared. So be careful. You don't want to get this far in the problem and just mess it up because of something that you did incorrectly in the calculator. Anyway, this comes out to be about 10.001 centimeters. So now Tate knows exactly how high his cylinder needs to be to hold 90.8 cubic centimeters of his stuff. Way to go, Tate. All right. I'm ready for a break. I don't know about you. Stick around. Don't go anywhere because we'll be right back. All right, welcome back to That Geometry Show. I'm your host, Kevin Corpy, and today we're talking about volume, looking at formulas. Uh, let's get right back to it, shall we? All right, time for right circular cones. Uh, we can find the volume of them as well, not just the surface area. It's going to require, again, another equation. So here we go. The volume V of a right circular cone with a height of H units and a base area of B. So again, capital B is standing not for a, a length of anything, but for an actual quantity that we have to find separately. It's given by one-third B times H. Now, because the base of a cone is, in fact, a circle, just like before, we can substitute in pi r squared for B, and we get an equivalent equation, pi thirds r squared H. So this one's kind of generic, and this one is very specific for a cone. They both work. I'd prefer this one here because we can actually find what capital B is in the context of the problem. Okay? Now, let's take a look at it. We have this cone down here. Now, remember the formula BH was the formula for the area of the cone. That's what we just saw on the last page. So what we're saying, essentially, is the volume of a right circular cone is a one-third of the volume of the cylinder that would contain it. So if you imagine drawing a cylinder around this cone right here, uh, it would be the smallest cylinder that contains this cone. Then the, if we could find the volume of the cone, we can basically carve away some of the volume. And when we're left with a third of what we originally started with, we will have the cone itself. So it's kind of like uh, a sculptor starting with a slab of cylinder. And we're carving out this cone. And we're going to be left with a third of the volume. It's pretty neat. All right, well, let's go ahead and find the volume of this cone. And I'm going to go ahead and use the pi third r squared h equation, which is found on a formula chart. Well, pi is pi, and 3 is 3, so that's really a constant. I need to find the radius. Well, if you look down here, it says that 8 inches, it's kind of hard to see on TV, is all the way across. Don't just plug 8 in right here. That's the diameter. The radius is half of 8, so it would be 4 squared. And in this case, the h, the height of the cone, is the altitude that forms a right angle to the bottom, and it's called 10. That's labeled as 10 here, so I can plug that in. So again, I've carefully identified my R and H. It wasn't given immediately. I had to do a little bit of work, divide by 2 to find R. But once I get to this step right here, now it's just a matter of carefully plugging everything into the calculator correctly. And if you do that, you'll get about 167.552, again, cubic inches. We're finding volume. All right, volume of a right pyramid. The volume V of a right pyramid with a height of H units and a base area of B, hmm, where have I seen that before, is given by V equals one-third of BH, where B is the area of the base. That's exactly the same generic formula we had for the cone. 
The only difference is our base is not going to be circular because it's a pyramid. It has a, uh, a pentagon or a hexagon or a square or a triangle. It has some polygon for a base. All right. Now, very similar, we can think of a pyramid as being one-third the volume of the smallest prism that contains it. So here's a, a square a pyramid. If you were to draw a cube, a box containing this pyramid, the smallest such box, you can think of starting with that block and carving out this pyramid from it. And the volume of the resultant pyramid will be one-third of the original cube, which is, again, kind of a neat idea. Um, we're going to get to that and say what here in just a second. We're going to talk about a famous mathematician who, who did something similar to that. All right, but before we get there, we need to find the volume of this pyramid, or the pyramid is going to get really unhappy. So we have the volume is one-third the area of the base times the height. Now we need to go ahead and find what the base is. It's 7 by 7, and it has a right angle. That's going to make it a square. So the area of a square is just the product of the length and the width, or the side length squared. 7 times 7. So I can plug in 1 third. The area of the base is the area of a square, side squared, 7 squared, times the height. Now this problem is pretty convenient. They're giving us the perpendicular altitude to the floor in the middle of the square, which is in fact the height, and it's 8. So now I've carefully plugged in. It's just a matter of evaluating. And if I do that, I get about 130.667 centimeters times centimeters times centimeters gives me cubic centimeters. So that pyramid could hold about 130.667 cubic centimeters of mummies or Egyptian artifacts or anything else that it contains. All right, now it's time for the say what? And we're going to be talking today about one of my favorite mathematicians of all time. And yes, math teachers have favorite mathematicians. Archimedes of Syracuse, he's regarded as one of the three greatest mathematicians of all time in the mathematical community. The other two being Isaac Newton and Carl Friedrich Gauss, in case you're interested. He lived uh, 287 B.C. to 212 B.C. roughly, and he was a great inventor in his time. He was well ahead of his time. He, he was very prized by, by the kings uh, and by the leaders of the day because he built uh, enormous war machines that gave them a strategic advantage when fighting. He, he burnt ships from the safety of land with a giant reflecting, uh, basically a magnifying glass. He built a, a claw, they called it the Archimedean claw, that lie in wait underneath the water. And as enemy ships pulled in, the claw would come up and unassumingly just topple it and bring it under. Um, he had a lot of other contributions that we still use today. If you've ever been to the Children's Museum here in town, they have a toy for kids. And it's basically his invention. It's an Archimedean screw, and it's still used today in generators. It's a nice way to raise water from one level to the next. You just have a simple spiral and a crank, and something turns the crank, and the water will climb up through the spirals, and you're raising water, which now you can use gravity to power something else. He also uh, gave us our first estimate of pi, which is the ratio of the circumference to a diameter of a circle, and he did it by a method called the method of exhaustion which is a very appropriate name because it was looking at a 96-sided polygon and uh, basically he got real tired doing it. But uh, the, the calculations were very complex and very tedious, especially in the day uh, where he lived. But he gave us pi to be between 3 and 1071st and 3 and 1070th. Um, he is also incidentally known as the father of integral calculus. And he preceded Newton and Leibniz, who get the credit for basically inventing or discovering calculus, but he did it 2,000 years before they were around. Okay, and I'm going to be talking a little bit about what the integral calculus involves. Um, but we're going to stick to primarily geometry. So why did I bring Archimedes up? Well, of all the great things that Archimedes did, he considered his most important discovery to be finding and proving that the ratio of a sphere to the cylinder that contains it, or we say a right circular cylinder to its inscribed inside sphere. He found the ratio of their volumes to be the magical number 3 to 2. It's a very tidy 3 to 2. Um, so what does that mean? That means if the volume of the cylinder was 3 cubic units, 
the volume of the largest sphere that is contained inside of it would be exactly two cubic units. Okay? He liked that discovery so much that he insisted that it be inscribed on his tombstone. And uh, supposedly it was. I'm not sure if it's still around, but uh, apparently it was there in the beginning. Now, he did this in the day before we had modern calculus, which, which can help us derive all of these equations now. What he did is he did it by introducing us to the method of infinitesimals, or slicing things very, 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 very thinly. He would look at cross-sections of this cylinder, let's say, slicing it parallel to the base, remember. And if you slice it infinitely thin, I'm going to draw a little thickness here, you're going to get something that looks like a dime or looks like a quarter. But if we slice it even thinner than that, we're basically looking at the volume of an infinitely thin disk. Uh, and so we're not going to have as much variation as we slice it from top to bottom when the radiuses or the diameters increase and decrease. And he basically calculated the volume of each of these very, 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 very narrow, what turn out to be disks or cylinders, and then he added them all together from low to high. And that's essentially what we do today in integral calculus. Um, but he did it long before we had the formulas. He did it kind of intuitively. And just think about how many infinitely thin slices we can take of this uh, sphere, quite a few. And that's why it's called the method of exhaustion. You get tired doing it. Now, he suffered a pretty horrible fate in the end. Uh, in in uh, 212 BC, when uh, they were sacking, the Roman guards were sacking uh, Syracuse, which is on the island of Sicily, Archimedes was going about his business, working calculations in the sand. And a Roman guard came upon him and found what he was doing, and Archimedes pleaded with them, please, sir, do not disturb my circles. And, and the guard um, was furious that Archimedes would not immediately give up what he was doing, that he ran him through with the bayonet, supposedly. Well, the Roman general Marcellus was infuriated because he had heard of Archimedes, and he wanted to capture Archimedes alive and use him uh, in the Roman army to develop war machines. So he kind of suffered an a, a untimely death, but he, he, he died right in the middle of doing what he loved, which was a math problem. Now, there's a famous quote by Archimedes. He also developed the principle of the lever and, and the principle of, of, of uh, water displacement, fluid displacement. He's really the only known mathematician uh, ever to, to streak through town uh, totally naked. Uh, he was yelling Eureka. You might want to look that up on Google. But here's what he said. He invented the lever. Uh, and he said, give me a place to stand and I shall move the earth. Very powerful statement. Well, he did, in fact, move the earth with his inventions. Um, and I hope you look Archimedes up and do some more research on him because he was an amazing, amazing mathematician, amazing inventor, uh, and an amazing historical figure overall. You've got to admit that Archimedes, dude, was a pretty cool mathematician. So next time you weren't a toga, make me think of Archimedes. That'd be pretty cool. Thanks for joining me today, and I hope you'll join me again next week for a very special, exciting spring break episode of That Geometry Show. Until then, I'll catch you on the flip side.